Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Rand. I'm the CEO here at Zama uh, with Pascal, my co-founder that you see here. And it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce you to Rosario Camarota from Intel, who's going to be talking about hardware acceleration. Uh, I can give you, you know, without giving too much spoiler, I can tell you that what he's going to be presenting is quite revolutionary. Uh, FHE.org is a community that is independent of researchers and developers interested in homomorphic encryption. We meet once a month uh, on Zoom for now, maybe physically in the future, actually physically in the future, we have a conference that we're planning. Uh, and we like to talk about any topic related to homomorphic encryption. You know, we had uh, Pascal uh, do an introduction on FHE a few months ago. We had Idaya talk about TFHE. We had uh, um, uh, I talk about uh, private set intersection, and we try to really bring different topics every time. We've been fortunate enough that we have quite a lot of people now in the meetup. Over uh, 1,500 people, in fact, uh, have signed up to the meetup, which is really amazing. I don't even know like how many how, the, how that many people are interested in FHC, considering that there is what a handful of researchers in the area still. Uh, but that's great, you know, it shows that there is a real interest in this technology and that we're going to really take it very far. Um, we have the next meetups uh, lined up already for the next few months. Uh, we are considering doing two meetups a month. So if you're interested in presenting, please let me know and we can actually do something. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Rosario, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne. Let me share the screen. And please do let me know if you can uh, see my screen. You're good. And, and if you can hear me well. You're good. Okay. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're good. Excellent, excellent. So uh, today um, uh, we're going to uh, talk about the need really. Um, you know, why um, we do need um, hardware that is uh, it's a bit different I mean, with what we have right now to um, realize the full benefit of uh, um, a fully homomorphic encryption. And so we'll talk about what these benefits are and also what else is needed. Uh, the hardware is, uh, is a component to it. The software stack is another component, but that's the technology part. And there is a lot more actually that needs to happen. Um, um, before we we actually um, uh, benefit uh, uh, about the privacy enhancing cryptography in general. Um, so uh, my name is Rosario Camarota, I go by RAW and I'm a principal engineer at uh, uh, Intel Labs. So before we get started, you know, Intel Labs is uh, is the moonshot division of Intel. Actually, it was named um, uh, like this late in uh, late last year. Uh, but the truth about Intel Labs is that uh, th th there is a lot ongoing uh, in terms of research. We look at uh, uh, seven to ten years horizon. Really, um, there are seven hundred plus researchers uh, on various disciplines. Um, and uh, the majority of the personnel at Intel Lab has at least uh, one PhD, um, all the way up, and this percolates uh, up into the uh, management chain. Uh, what we do at Intel Labs really is to solve this uh, hard problem and bring thousandfold uh, improvements uh, to benefit society. And improvements may mean many things, but within the topics of research, um, uh, one of uh, our top priority is uh, related to uh, cryptography and uh, security mechanisms, and we'll talk about that in a second, as well as uh, uh, standards and the industry organization. Among the various external engagement which we keep alive, because clearly the community is, is usually a lot larger than uh, just in the labs, and it spans across industry organizations as, as well as uh, um, academic and government uh, um, uh, research uh, groups. Um, uh, we engage in external university research as well as uh, um, uh, government uh, um, entities uh, such as uh, the Department of Defense um, in the United States, the National Science Foundation, 
Semiconductor Industry Corporation, and etc. But the goal of bringing benefit to society by improving at least 1,000x performance, energy efficiency, security, whatever the metrics may uh, come apply, is the key mission of uh, uh, Intel Labs. So about me, I, in the years, I have worn a lot of hats. Um, uh, starting from uh, uh, communication, I'm from Italy, and people in Italy are really good uh, at radio communication. And then moving to United States to high performance computing and percolating into security um, uh, with uh, uh, side channel and uh, fault analysis. Um, you know, by now people believe that I'm an applied cryptographer, which is probably true. Uh, but clearly there is a lot more around it because it's not about only the cryptographic primitives, but also protocols and system security. And of course, at some point I percolated into standardization, which is that point in time in your career where you reach basically uh, close to the, the pinnacle of it, um, where you actually start coordinating entities worldwide to um, converge into the, the realization of interoperable technologies. And here at Intel Labs, I actually lead a group called the Privacy Technologies Research, which focuses on privacy enhancing uh, cryptography and they in uh, the intersection of these technologies with uh, um, uh, more traditional uh, um, uh, security mechanisms. Part of it is my personal um, um, kind of uh, um, objective uh, in contributing this type of research is basically dissolving the tension between the data sharing and collaboration and data privacy. And this is really to sustain the progress in uh, data digitization and learning. And the reason for that is because drawing insight from data population, uh, from uh, population scale data uh, becomes a key um, for uh, um, many advances of society, including the creation of new jobs, uh, including uh, facing uh, problems that are um, uh, of global scale, like for example, uh, what happened in the past two years or so with the, with the, the spread of COVID. Um, and other things. And in my role at Intel Labs, basically in this moment, I run the largest group of, of cryptographer ever existed at Intel, and the, the, the team is uh, expanding. I'm the principal investigator of the DARPA Deprive program, and we'll talk about that uh, in, uh, in a second. Uh, but also, um, I contribute to uh, the execution of academic centers which we'll also talk about um, in a second. So going into um, a little bit more of, uh, of the talk, when we talk about the data sharing uh, and uh, collaboration, the technology is exciting. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, however, um, as technologists, uh, uh, we need to enter into um, a, a mindset shift um, a state of mind, really, where uh, we need to look at each stage of uh, the data life cycle. So data sharing and collaboration is inherently a um, multi-stakeholder problem. And, you know, at each point of the data life cycle, we should always ask uh, ourselves in the design of a system, so where is the data? who wants the data and who can access the data? And the answer actually is non-trivial because when you look into a multi-stakeholder systems, you always find that there are institutions involved, that there are regulators involved and customers, and there is tensions between these needs because institutions understand that there is uh, um, an advantage in sharing data, but of course they don't want to lose competitiveness. And at the same time, um, institutions are also very well aware that the enactment of uh, uh, regulation for uh, uh, privacy regulations may actually damage their assets um, if there is uh, um, um, a loss of third-party data. So that risk is actually pretty high. 
In terms of regulators, regulators really um, understand basically what's going on, but they are concerned about potential abuse of the data and started acting on it. And customers, uh, it depends whether the customer is another institution or is actually an end customer, but there is a spectrum of awareness and need. And any time that it comes about the privacy, you know, there is a challenge and there is an opportunity. The challenge is that uh, everyone, every single being, not necessarily human being on earth, as an intuitive understanding of privacy, I like security, as an intuitive understanding of privacy and when privacy is violated, right? And because of this, uh, the, there are a lot of concerns. So, I'm, what is the benefit that when, when we get to human beings, what is the benefit that I'm getting uh, in receiving all these per personalized recommendations, for example? And what is the cost that I'm actually paying implicitly? Uh, by enabling this uh, person uh, personalization in my recommendations. And so it's never uh, um, clear, but here is the excitement of the opportunity because everyone has an intuitive understanding of privacy and the privacy violation. The role of privacy enhancing uh, cryptography, even if it is cryptography, traditionally enabling security technologies, becomes even more important, but it's seen under a different light, that is, everyone is aware of the benefit. And so when we think to system, really, we need to think at the tension now of multiple parties, which is not necessarily um, uh, the way uh, technology is, um, is built. And so when we look about uh, protection, right, uh, they are, this, 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 this image is actually drawn from uh, um, um, the NIST uh, privacy um, uh, uh, risk management framework for privacy. And it actually puts together uh, two, the two framework, the new one that looks into privacy risk and the older one that has been established for uh, many years that looks into cybersecurity risk. And one thing that is interesting is the intersection between these two framework which is mostly when privacy enhancing cryptography actually uh, becomes extremely uh, useful in elevating the bar of data confidentiality with respect to taking a leap with respect to the bar of confidentiality that exists now uh, with existing technology uh, to a level that even if an institution is breached and the breach basically intercepts data that carries a personal identifiable information, the risk of third-party data leakage is actually minimized. And so when we look in the spectrum of technologies that we have into the cybersecurity risk, and they are associated to um, uh, protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of assets, this may be intellectual property or other type of data, we see basically a spectrum of cryptographic and non-cryptographic technologies to enable traditional security mechanisms. But when it comes to unintended consequences of data processing, which is exactly what we were talking about, data processing and collaboration, um, we look at two different classes of technologies. And, and there are kind of commonalities in terms of the goal that they want to achieve, but there are also differences. Because when we talk of the non-crypto technologies like threaded learning, differential privacy, metrics like risk score and things, those are actually very domain application specific. Whereas the cryptographic technologies, the private enhancing cryptography, such as homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, not only uh, are not domain specific, but also uh, cope with the portion of the things that is more related to the privacy breaches and less related to the fact that uh, learning from data may end up in an outcome that can memorize the data itself. And so it's something that comes from the algorithms rather than uh, the data protection. So in this talk, we'll talk about the privacy enhancing cryptography specifically. And the way I look at it uh, is really addressing that intersection in between the cybersecurity risk and uh, uh, the privacy risks where you can elevate the bar of confidentiality by keeping the data encrypted at all times, which is not what happened today. 
When it comes to cryptography, right, because we are talking now about private financing cryptography, we also need to uh, be kind of mindful of what's happening, uh, uh, you know, from the perspective of the complexity and the data types that are involved in, into this cryptography to try to understand why we really need to depart from the way we are looking into technologies. So traditionally, we look at the, uh, the creation of security mechanisms um, such as uh, bulk encryption, message integrity, key management, digital signatures with the various uh, building blocks, cryptographic building blocks. And as we move basically, and, and with these, you ensure secure storage and, co and communication, typically pre-quantum. So as we move to post-quantum, then we are replacing some of the building block, especially uh, those that are used for public key cryptography. Uh, but we are providing the same security mechanism at uh, a higher complexity. And then uh, as we are moving toward uh, adding to security mechanism something that, did, something that it didn't exist before, which is basically processing encrypted data, we are actually moving into uh, a completely different uh, um, uh, realm of object. And I want to point your attention on the, the red uh, uh, basically boxes that is saying as cryptography is advancing, whether you are uh, um, looking into the, the same security mechanisms as before, or you are adding basically the ability to process encrypted data, there are two things that are changing. So the first is that the typical data type that you are processing are actually different and more and more complex. And then the complexity of the algorithms that are used, basically the cryptographic primitives that are used to process these data types also increases with time. You know, for some of the traditional security mechanisms at speed, you already um, enjoy basically the, the um, hardware acceleration, but moving forward, not only it is important to uh, provide the suitable acceleration mechanisms to this type of cryptography, but also there is another mindset shift that has to happen. The um, traditional security mechanisms involve a cryptography that pretty much operates on independent chunks of data. The new security mechanism to process encrypted data are operating on something where uh, data is not necessarily, the operation are not necessarily independent from each other. And the reason for that is because the um, flow of operation is completely driven by the workload. So there is another element that uh, um, requires really a mindset shift on how you actual architect um, systems uh, around the new security mechanism. So the timeline basically is such that we are increasing complexity, but we also need to look into uh, adding these new security mechanisms with systems that are suitable. And so this also hint um, to another type of paradigm shift that we'll talk in a second. And so with typical uh, cryptography, right, uh, uh, for, for, for if, if I bring a perspective from the semiconductor industry, right, um, and then, you know, to give an example, in early 2000, um, um, uh, Intel basically introduced the advanced, uh, the advanced encryption standard a new instructions at extension, you know, which really democratized um, um, how do you uh, think uh, to some cryptographic algorithms from the instruction set architecture level. And then the crypto is actually used in much more uh, sophisticated security mechanisms to protect application secret, virtual machines, and etc. But all that we are saying here is that we are protecting data when the data is temporarily not used. What that means is that any time that the data is in flight or in storage, we can uh, uh, use some types of cryptography to protect it, to authenticate it, and to make sure that the data has not been corrupted, right? But any time you need to process the data, you need to decrypt the data. And the consequence of that is that during that time that you are decrypting a processing, again, I think to the interception between the cybersecurity risk and privacy risks, that data is vulnerable to abuse. And in addition to that, because you do need to decrypt the data, the secret keys are actually another target of attack. 
by introducing the privacy enhancing uh, uh, cryptography, what we do is that we actually add another piece, uh, the missing piece into this pie, where you process data, um, um, encrypted data without decryption. And by doing so, anytime that the classic security mechanisms basically is circumvented, the data not only stays uh, always encrypted, but the decryption key do not reside on the system anymore. And the only thing that you really need to think about is that this data, even in its encrypted form, can be abused in the sense that the encrypted blob can be used multiple times. But other than that, uh, there is no way to introspect its, uh, uh, its content, at least in principle. And so to give an example, among the various uh, homomorphic encryption uh, uh, among the various uh, privacy enhancing cryptographic techniques um, uh, that exist, uh, um, we do multi-party computation, we do other things, uh, but homomorphic encryption is a number of appealing traits that other uh, cryptographic methods actually um, do not for many use cases that are meaningful uh, for the semiconductor industry. So in this example, if we're looking to a hospital that wants to uh, process um, medical images by leveraging a third party service, there is a first step in the establishment of this infrastructure, which the third party service wants a trusted pocket at the cloud provider. This is where you provide the classic security mechanisms to deploy its service, okay? So this isolation mechanism, which may be um, typically, it's a trusted execution environment. However, um, it is instantiated. Uh, it's something that protects the third-party service from the cloud provider. Now, with homomorphic encryption, you do not need basically to concern about protecting the input to the medical image from the third-party service. And from the point of view of the, the hospital, who has a delegation by a patient to outsource processing of its um, medical data, then there is not a concern really about the cloud provider, but it's the concern of the misuse that happen within the third party service. So with the homomorphic encryption, the third party service is, can be instrumented to process encrypted data, and it performs the annotation of the medical image without decryption. And going back, Right, only the intended party that has the decryption key can actually access to the um, uh, clear content of the image plus its annotations. Now, this diagram that seems uh, um, kind of simple has a number of uh, properties that I want to share with you. So the first property is, is that in this deployment of homomorphic encryption, it does not make, I mean, from the, from the hospital perspective, whether you are using homomorphic encryption or any other type of public key, public key primitive does not matter. It's completely transparent. So for once we are introducing a new technology that has really no disruption whatsoever in the data life cycle. And what that means more importantly is that uh, you know, the annotated image, right, as an expected monetary value that does not dilute as long as the cost of homomorphic encryption can be hidden uh, at the cloud side. So the data life cycle is not diluted. The value of the data in this case is not diluted. And more importantly, there are other properties. So usually when you are uh, um, uh, processing on the cloud, data regulation force uh, the, the cloud servers to actually reside in the same uh, uh, jurisdiction where the data is created. For example, you are processing data originated uh, within the United States, uh, the cloud servers needs to reside within the United States. Why is that? Because usually without homomorphic encryption, even within isolation environment, you are actually decrypting the data. But with homomorphic encryption, the data, and in this setting in particular, the data is always decrypted at the point of origin. So which means that if it starts, originates in the United States, the servers can reside anywhere in the world, 
when the results of uh, processing goes back to the United States, that where the data is decrypted. In a sense, it actually breaks, um, more than breaks, allows to uh, cross jurisdiction boundaries. So this property plus preserving the data life cycles are two properties that are extremely appealing to reduce and the reduction of the risk of third party data leakage at the service provider side are three things that are very distinctive of amorphic encryption that uh, uh, all three together actually in many cases actually do not exist uh, for other privacy enhancing technologies. But there's more to this because that was about retaining the expected value of some data processing. If a lot of data is put together and, basic, and what happens is that you are increasing the data set size, then in principle, uh, you are also getting better insights from population data at scales that come from multiple stakeholders. And that has a lot of application in various domains. The part that is interesting in all of this uh, is that with respect to the data uh, sharing and collaborations, what we have seen in between 2019 and 2020 is that, that there have been uh, large deployments of homomorphic encryption in, um, in use cases that actually do benefit society, such as um, the improvement of the credit uh, um, rating system in Korea, as well as the deployment in Microsoft Edge of a plugin that allows you to detect whether a password has been um, um, stolen without actually compromising the privacy of the owner of the password. And you know, in the case of the Microsoft uh, uh, plugin, uh, and by the way, as a full disclosure, Microsoft is our partners in one of the projects that I will, will, will talk about in a second. Um, it's the first time that the company that has been worshiping homomorphic encryption for so many years has actually been deploying homomorphic encryption in one of their products. And to me, that's has immense value about the confidence in the technology. But in this case, unlike the case before, is about increasing the expected value of the insights that you draw from the data while still keeping um, uh, preserving uh, privacy and uh, honoring regulatory concerns. So we have seen two things. And actually three. So the first one is that from a technology perspective, enabling continuous data, which is something that, for example, companies like Intel had done by percolating the cryptography into hardware, allows you basically to close the circle of uh, a protection profile through confidentiality of data at any point of the data life cycle. The second thing that we have seen is that basically the data life cycle does not change while the risk of third party data leakage reduces, right? And the expected value of um, the recommendations is not diluted. Monetary value of the recommendation is not diluted. And this is the third case where we're saying by increasing in a privacy preserving way, the, uh, the, the data set from which you draw insights, um, you can actually increase the expected value of the insights while preserving privacy. So there's all good things that come. So morphic encryption, because of all these things and because of uh, um, the fact that uh, really since 2016, homorphic encryption has been pretty much stable on two lines of development. It's homorphic encryption on polynomial rings. And there are primarily two flavors. The, the more uh, legacy one that looks into BGB, BFB, and CKKS schemes and uh, the more modern uh, um, uh, flavor that looks into uh, ring GSW and mixed um, uh, ring schemes. But the effect of this is that the data sharing and collaboration you know, has a lot of attention. Until now, there has been only a software ecosystem that has been uh, um, growing, uh, probably in particular because of the advances that uh, uh, have been done with things like, like, like the FHE and, uh, and more. There is application proliferation, and this is not exactly, this is not exactly true, 
meaning that there are many names here, but the, the, um, there are very few things that you can actually do with homomorphic encryption just in software. But there's definitely a rejuvenated interest in uh, industry, government, and academic uh, beyond the research group. I don't want to say it's already in production, but um, it's quite far from that, in my opinion. Uh, but there is a rejuvenated interest. So let's see where all of this came um, uh, to that. If we look into fully homomorphic encryption, right, uh, you have um, in, uh, in the public key uh, setting, uh, first of all, it's an encryption technique. So you would expect that there is encryption and decryption. And uh, the important thing is that the encryption is non-deterministic. Um, but if it was only for this, everything would work fine. Then there is the homomorphism, where homomorphic encryption is actually mostly defined with respect to the decryption function, at least the, the flavors that we have seen until now. We'll see that other things will come in the coming years that are not as, as such. But basically, what happens is that uh, I can perform additions and multiplications and polynomial operation and decrypt to the right, or unencrypted data and decrypt to the right result under certain conditions. Uh, but something that is probably less known, probably not to this forum, um, if uh, the ciphertext encrypts a bit, I can actually decrypt to the truth table of an end gate, which means that uh, I can actually implement any kind of computable function. And of course, uh, there is the fully part, uh, which is saying, well, you remember that we add non-determinism into the encryption uh, functions, and there are two problems when you actually, when you process ciphertext. So the first problem is that uh, um, during processing ciphertext, uh, the, that, that randomness that you have introduced during encryption keep growing. And if it grows beyond a certain boundary, because this is a morphic encryption on polynomial ring, you know, your decryption is corrupted. So that's one thing. And the other part of it, uh, you can see both, both things in, uh, in the equation of the, the, the multiplication, like the last statement. The other thing is that if I don't do something um, after uh, um, each operation and especially multiplications, you know, the complexity of the subsequent operation keeps increasing exponentially. And you can see that you start with the term, then you have three terms, and then you keep on going. So the difficulty really of homomorphic encryption is about the fact that if I have to translate a program from clear text to homomorphic encryption, on the one end, there is the easy part, which is, okay, I'm gonna write the circuit. I mean, that's uh, uh, easy, but not very intuitive for a lot of people. But, you know, I'm gonna write the combinatorial circuit of this, of this thing, right? And then I basically replace uh, each addition and multiplication with its homomorphic uh, uh, thing, and I ensure that at each stage I can decrypt correctly somehow. But then uh, the sequence of addition and uh, multiplication in the homomorphic domain are interleaved by ciphertext and noise management operation, which are actually the complex part of uh, um, homomorphic encryption. And so with this, uh, basically, you know everything that you need to know about homomorphic encryption. The rest is details. Maybe you may not be able to, um, you know, implement the library from this, but that's all that it is. And what that means uh, is the following. You know, I will focus on ring, uh, um, learning with error because, because it's more dramatic. Um, um, but more modern flavors are less, uh, the, the problems are less severe than what I'm, what I'm going to talk about now. So the first thing is that, uh, and this is something that is not gonna go away unless there is some uh, really serious improvement on uh, the theoretical side, is that the encryption procedure is heavily inefficient. And what that means in practice is that if I have a single, um, like, a, like a native data, a data type, for example, an integer, like a, a generous integer, a four byte integer, right? So, and I encrypt it, I, I can end up into something that is two megabytes large. So there is, com there is data size explosion. And even with the batching techniques and thing, things like that, it depends on the use case where there is data size explosion is, uh, is a severe problem or a less severe problem, but the problem doesn't go away. 
And the second thing is that any time uh, associated to the data explosion, any time that I uh, really want to perform uh, a clear text operation in the homomorphic domain, if I target the traditional uh, hardware, you know, for a single CPU operation per clear text that I have on, uh, on the left-hand side, I need to replace that with the equivalent parameters that we have seen in the previous slide with more than 10 million CPU operations per ciphertext. So there is a huge explosion in the, um, in the, um, in the, comp in the compute that uh, comes also with uh, a lot more data movement and a lot more power uh, consumption and etc. And so, you know, with this in mind, that's pretty much where we are, you know, from the 70s, um, we, homomorphic encryption changed in the sense that it became more and more capable, right? So now with the fully homomorphic encryption, you know, we can process arbitrary functions um, at a certain cost, but before we couldn't. But there are, the challenge actually are not only about the computational cost. If I look at the schema that, uh, that Pascal introduced in, in, in 99, right? So you could actually address chain of, uh, of additions. And if I have to add an integrity tag uh, to ensure data integrity after each modular um, 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 exponentiation, it's very easy to add. And then I know that after each operation, the result of the data um, is, is what I expect, and I can prove that. But when we move toward the fully homomorphic encryption, it is true that actually we, we have the capacity of processing arbitrary function and more and more efficiently, right? But there is a challenge on how to use these uh, techniques in combination with existing security mechanisms. I'm not going to talk about that uh, uh, now, uh, but what I want to point to your attention is the following, that uh, in the past 10 years, you know, since uh, um, fully homomorphic encryption was invented, you know, in the very beginning, it was a trillion times slower than clear text, okay? And then thanks to advances in, um, in the theory, really, so moving from the execution, the evaluation of Boolean circuit to arithmetic circuit, and then allowing um, uh, to use the capacity of a ciphertext to pack multiple data in fewer ciphertexts. And then later on, uh, um, trying to expose data level, data level parallelism um, uh, through introducing various type of transformations and the composition of the ciphertext. You know, fast forward from 2009, I would say in between 2012 and 2013, homomorphic encryption became uh, only a million times slower, right, um, than before, which is which is a great thing. But then we entered this uh, this um, kind of era, which has influenced homomorphic encryption in the past 10 years, which I keep keep addressing it as an evolutionary approach to homomorphic encryption, where the amount of, uh, um, you know, advances in theory have been less and less scarce um, and more and more, uh, I'm sorry, have been less and less frequent, right? Uh, uh, especially on the Ringel WE uh, branch of homomorphic encryption, um, to the point that uh, really to give an example, because this is homomorphic encryption on polynomial ring, uh, the number of number theoretic transformations uh, per second that you do is not a precise estimation of performance by no means, and there are many reasons because it's not. Um, but it's a good proxy, right? You can only reach a throughput that is in between a few hundred to a few thousand that enables you to do things like, uh, you know, a simple task like linear regression, um, some lookup tables, some private set intersection like of, of, of modest size and things like that. So it allows you to do proof of concept, but it doesn't give you, um, you know, proof of concept is a dangerous uh, kind of um, uh, place to be because the proof of concept basically freezes 
the requirements that you have. And then you can say that uh, at that point in time, you can use homomorphic encryption for doing something. But the point is that requirements change every six months, right? And, uh, you know, looking at, you know, a progressive improvement in performance actually doesn't give you the sustainability that you think for the technology to um, be introduced, let's say, in a production uh, uh, environment where really re requirements keep changing relatively rapidly on a six months to a year basis. And so what happens is that this, this, this 10,000 um, number theoretic transform per second are not nearly sufficient to get close to, um, let's say, clear text performance. And the results of this is the following. So in 2012, you know, amorphic encryption was a million times slower than, uh, than clear text on CPU. Uh, looking at uh, all that has been done uh, on, uh, on existing hardware, even though there seemed to be a reduction of two orders of magnitude in overhead on the basic arithmetic, you remember for some of the previous, from some of the previous slides, that it's not about the arithmetic, it's about the complexity of the algorithms for ciphertext management, ciphertext and noise management operations. So if you do it honestly, right, without ever decrypting, then it turns out that this additional 2x overhead is not really good enough in practice. Because you end up, for example, to do four hours per inference on a toy neural network. And the consequence of that is not that, you know, performance maybe can scale in with the many cores and things like that. But the, the truth is that it becomes not cost effective in terms of total cost of ownership. So even though you can realize that proof of concept from a performance perspective, then uh, the electricity bill that you are asking someone to pay for deploying your solution is too high. And so we are not going anywhere with the evolutionary approaches. Okay, we do need revolutionary approach to homomorphic encryption. So the first is that the um, DARPA was the first entity that recognized the value of enabling continuous encryption, but also the fact that we needed to do it in a cost-effective way. And so they asked the, um, basically to, to build an ASIC that targets five orders of magnitude performance improvement. So going from the million within 10x um, overhead from clear text. And in order to do that, uh, the elements that are needed really are large um, and flexible. So that flexibility part is actually the tricky part, vector units. Um, the memory hierarchy needs to be re-architected completely. So think to the memory hierarchy of a processor. You know, the closest level of uh, um, memory that you have to the processor is L1 cache. Right, it's 32 kilobytes, right? If you think to data expansion that the single ciphertext might be of megabytes, then you do have problems in actually using that uh, small amount of memory um, to um, minimize data movement in the context of homomorphic encryption. And of course, as these embodiments are actually uh, relatively large when we are talking about large word size, we're talking about the word size that involve a vector parallelism that can process at the same time hundreds of uh, thousands of bits per cycle uh, in the same units. Okay, you do need basically to formal verify uh, the, the data paths. So Intel and Microsoft uh, led by Intel are jointly uh, performing in uh, this program. And the idea is that the expected outcome of the DARPA deprived program is providing this performance within three years from now um, with respect to the history that we have seen in the retrospection of the past 10 years. And what that really means, it means going from thousand to billions of entity per second within a little over three years from now. Okay, in order to do that, uh, um, what you really need to think about is that profile that I gave in the beginning where the data type, the data types involved in cryptography that is progressively introducing either new cryptographic properties or enabling new security mechanisms is increasing. 
and then you are introducing processing. So what happens is that any native data type that you have and you use to optimize your architecture for is going to disappear because when it's encrypted, it will become um, you know, a complex ciphertext, something that is big and ugly and that needs to be handled natively. So that's what these architecture are for. Very good. And so, you know, at Intel, you know, this is basically the strategy to enable all of this. Um, this is, there is on the technologies, the main engine uh, is the execution of uh, the DARPA deprived program that does not only target uh, Ring LW schemes, even though the target of that program is BGB, um, but it targets homomorphic encryption, the, the efficient execution of homomorphic encryption on polynomial rings. The other part of it uh, is that, uh, you know, we do need academic research and also industrial research. You know, for that, uh, we uh, spawn uh, two research center, centers. So the first is fundamentally um, approaching problems, such as composability, homomorphic encryption, you know, trying to relax a little bit that constraint that homomorphic encryption is um, really defined with respect to the decryption function. Um, and trying to rip off more efficiency out of this, this new formulation. But also part of the Crypto Frontier Center really is to advance programming language compilation uh, for homomorphic encryption. That's something that uh, is, is, is really missing. I think, uh, um, it, you know, for this, for example, we, we partner with, uh, with ETH and you had an earlier talk from, 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 from Alexander uh, uh, Vian, um, and try to, to build this compilation infrastructure. But we have seen, you know, that there are other examples. One of these is, uh, is concrete. Another one is the transpiler from, from Google. But the problem of translation of homomorphic encryption it should also be approached with in mind the fact that the ciphertext is a native data type. So is the native data type for, uh, for processing encrypted data. And then of course, this is cryptography, right? So the, the, there's no going anywhere without international standards. Um, and, and here, what I'm trying to really to express is, so international standards are important for enabling interoperability um, uh, of technologies. When it comes to cryptography, is basically make sure that the security mechanisms actually work uh, pretty much everywhere you are deploying them. In the case of homomorphic encryption, because the ecosystem has been mostly driven by the application programming interface um, of the existing software, you know, there is on one end the excitement of people that say, oh, I can process encrypted data, this is great. Right, uh, you know, th this comes, the excitement, uh, you know, fades immediately, um, you know, as soon as you look at the performance uh, after, you know, a significant amount of effort to get your first program running, right? Um, but the point is that when it comes to enter a secure development life, life cycle, um, you do need to have best practices and, um, 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 and certification programs around the appropriate use of homomorphic encryption. Just to give you um, an example, if you actually uh, buy a headless device today and it has this little sticker Wi-Fi certified on top of it and then you snap a picture on the QR code of the headless device and it's connected to your Wi-Fi infrastructure, that protocol is called uh, Wi-Fi Easy Connect and it's one of the uh, standards basically that I launched in 2018, I believe, uh, with many people. But the point is that that sticker is not only telling people that there is some, something interoperable, it's telling people what is the risk that when you scan that QR code at Starbucks like on, on, that is given to you with the receipt, right? what is the risks that you are going to face when you make your device to join that network? Right? So for homomorphic encryption, there doesn't exist anything like this. And the fact, uh, if I think to people, if I think to myself, right, I forget all that I know about technology, 
and I enter uh, a store where they take a picture of me, it, it doesn't mean anything to me that someone is telling me, you know, be sure your privacy is preserved because we are using homomorphic encryption. And I'm like, so what? You know, I do want to see that sticker that is, I don't know, HE certified or FHE certified in order to uh, ensure that I myself, that I'm building the infrastructure within this new smart store, um, have the freedom to construct the infrastructure from multiple vendors, right? And deploy this infrastructure from multiple vendors and also giving the guarantees uh, to my customers that they have been following the best practices for deployment. So to me, enabling homomorphic encryption and uh, privacy enhancing cryptography in general, so means doing the technology, means doing the standardization, means doing the academic research. And we'll see a lot of accelerations of all of this basically in the past, in the next three years. So Intel spends tens of million dollars per year um, in academic research. And when it is related to, to um, privacy enhancing cryptography, we spawn two research centers. So the first look at the applications, right? Of existing privacy enhancing technologies, both looking into algorithmic and um, um, you know, cryptography based and their integration. So that's one of, one of the key problems. There was a survey um, a few months ago, and then that survey basically disappeared. Um, um, uh, you know, a few weeks later than I, than I noticed it. That was basically, it was a list of testimonials, basically of various stakeholders in the, in the, in the, in the field that were saying, okay, what kind of uh, privacy enhancing technologies they use and uh, what they are using it for, and is it a product, is it a, um, a proof of concept? Many were proof of concepts, uh, and, and that's not surprising. Uh, someone was claiming uh, products and uh, things like that. But one thing that uh, really uh, came to, um, you know, really came to my eyes was that any time the tomomorphic encryption was listed, it was always listed alone. There was an, and that's not because it gives you all the properties that you need. So they, I kind of suspect that there is a clear uh, uh, barrier of integration uh, there that we are seeing, but it might be a lot more severe than we are seeing. And then the cryptographic frontier centers uh, engage uh, um, leading academics in the field, you know, usual suspects um, in uh, San Diego, in Leuven, um, and others uh, on the teams, uh, a clearly of uh, privacy enhancing cryptography, but also post quantum cryptography and the lightweight cryptography. So I talked about standard. We have an approved work item at ISO IC, uh, where many of the people, including Pascal and um, Ilaria and others on, uh, on these calls, are, uh, are key contributors. Um, and, and this is to say that there, there is a roadmap here. So we are moving toward the publication of the standard in 2024, and many, including uh, um, you know Professor Chon in South Korea, uh, believe basically that 2024 is going to be as from the publication of the standard is going to be a, a, a huge turn of adoption, and and I strongly believe that that is going to be the case. So it's where the proof of concept will really uh, bloom. And so, you know, to conclude, um, uh, you know, there is demand for uh, privacy enhancing cryptography, right? And this is to strike the balance between uh, institution, regulator, and customers. And that, uh, uh, you know, requires a mindset shift of the um, uh, technology providers in have technology that takes into account a lot more stakeholders uh, than before. Um, privacy enhancing uh, cryptography um, are definitely going to be um, to play a key role. So definitely, you know, can play a key role uh, in enabling new business models, as well as uh, elevating the features and the capabilities of products that are already in the market. But a lot more security research is needed, as well as uh, education, dissemination, and standardization. So once we have done all of these, are we done? Certainly not. 
Um, and there are two main problems that, uh, that I think are on the table. The first problem is really that uh, uh, privacy enhancing cryptography provides you with the confidentiality. Some of those, uh, you know, add uh, uh, other type of proofs and security insurance, um, but they don't cover all the properties that you need. They are very good to look into the, in into the intersection between the cybersecurity risks and the privacy risks. But beyond that, uh, there is all the domain application specific uh, um, issues that come with learning that needs to be addressed with orthogonal technologies that might actually conflict with the deployment of privacy enhancing uh, cryptography. And so the, there's still a lot of research ahead of us, but a lot of opportunities as, as well. And so it's, uh, we, we should be happy to have the opportunities. It's actually an exciting um, uh, field. So you will excuse, I need to flush this for, uh, for about five seconds uh, or so. And then I'm happy to take questions. Awesome. Thank you, Rosario. Uh, that's great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, guys, do you, does anyone have any question? Uh, you can ask them directly. The easiest is to just unmute yourself and ask the question to Ro, uh, and then uh, he can answer from there. Ro, I don't think you have to share a screen anymore unless someone wants to ask something specific about the slides. Oh, yes. And I see some, uh, okay, let's go in order here. Uh, uh, Katarina. Yeah. I can go first. Oh. Oh, okay. Just unmute oh. yourself and just directly ask your question. Easier. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Ro. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so I'm starting to work in uh, FHG accelerator design as well in ASICs. So I was wondering, uh, can this problem be a little bit trivialized since there's orders of uh, magnitude of gap between the performance that we see on encrypted data? Uh, can we kind of trivialize this problem uh, specific to certain applications? For instance, uh, I, I saw uh, one paper from MIT uh, which took, uh, which performed uh, machine, uh, machine learning with encrypted data but they kind of said that they are going to store uh, their uh, weights uh, in an un encrypted format, which mm -hmm. kind of trivializes that problem uh, that you mentioned. So is, ah. is it a good direction to look at in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the performance, uh, narrowing down the performance gap? And what about the security implications of such models? Yeah, so uh, let me um, uh, give you let me give you an example. Of course, there is always less time than the things that uh, that I would like to talk about, right? Um, but in one of the slides where um, um, you know you were seeing that there was the the client giving the medical image to the server and etc., right? Um, so in that case, uh, uh, the, um, um, the, um, the, um, the service, right, and the coefficient of the service do not necessarily need to be encrypted with a morphic encryption because those coefficients are part of the intellectual property of the service and whatever is protecting those coefficients is the isolation environment. So you can choose to do homomorphic encryption with that um, but now when you mix up, uh, um, um, you, you, you're basically referring to, so that, that's one thing. So depending on the deployment model, some of the data that is involved in the computation, at least initially, right, can reside in the plain text form. Now what that does to you is the following. It moves you the operations from being ciphertext, ciphertext to ciphertext plain text operations. And what that gives you is basically a speed up of a 3x, like net, because, because the plain text is a single thing and so Now, things like this definitely help uh, in all of this, but it's not obvious where you actually can deploy that. In the case of machine learning serve, serving, you know, because part of this data that you are processing is a portion of the intellectual property are the weights and biases of the model. 
right? That is protected through isolation environment because that's the risk that the service is actually absorbing on itself. I deploy my service on an untrusted infrastructure and I get all the, risk that are, the risks that are associated with having my service running into an isolation environment. It's perfectly fine, <laughs> right? That's why you can do that. But in general, it's not necessarily the, um, uh, the case. And uh, 3X is great, but it's only in the initial part of the operations. So when you do the first portion of the convolution, after that, it's all ciphertext. So what gives you to the to another advantage that it gives you to the service side is that the plain text is a lot smaller than a cipher text. It's a lot larger than a clear text, that's true, but it's a lot smaller than a cipher text. So it gives you some other advantages. So those things are definitively pursuable, right? Um, but they don't circumvent necessarily the main problem that the encoding procedure is inefficient and the encryption procedure is even more inefficient. So uh, that actually brings me to the second question. Uh, mm -hmm. You talk about the encoding procedures, and there has been a lot of development on how to <laughs> efficiently encode and efficiently pack things so that you can mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, since these are large multiplications, so you actually can get to the same throughput that mm -hmm. uh, you would have in, uh, gotten on unencrypted data. Uh, but but now you require a certain kind of new operations like rotation. So, uh, yeah. so my ne next question is that which of these kernels uh, have you seen to be the most uh, problematic ones? As, oh, okay. as a hardware as a hardware architecture uh, okay. architect, uh, what are the things that I should be working on? Oh, as a, so the, the the memory hierarchy. Believe me, the, the computation problem. You know, as as you can throw transistor at it, it's actually the easy one. Um, well. Okay, it's not that easy, okay, but it's easier um, than uh, moving efficiently uh, data around the chip. And let me give you an example of this. Um, uh, so a scalable way of doing matrix multiplication in homomorphic encryption, whether um, you know, something is encrypted, something is plain text, so let's assume that everything is encrypted, okay, um, is basically to um, 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 decompose the matrix, right, and uh, perform some, some operations. And then uh, um, there are several algorithms that drives you to do a minimum amount of rotation to scale up basically the size of the matrix, right? Now, anytime that you do rotation, you are using a different switching key, right? So reordering these operations in a way that you are, uh, how do I say this, minimizing the number of times that you are bringing switching key in close to the processor, you know, clearly is not necessarily uh, boils down to something that is directly related to hardware, but at the microarchitecture level is what you should be looking at uh, uh, to minimize data movement. So as you can see, this doesn't have anything to do with the speed of computation. Right. It's about managing locality um, properly. And the problem that you have with homomorphic encryption, unlike clear text data, is that uh, uh, locality is not only locality of the, um, the ciphertext, which is difficult to, I mean, in principle, it's difficult to manage because uh, you don't know what's inside the ciphertext, right? And how it is packed, by the way. Uh, but in practice, because your program is, um, is, 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 is a fixed circuit, you have a lot of information that you can leverage ahead of time. But the other part of locality comes with really uh, what is the portion of which key should be resident and what time. And that, uh, you know, has the high potential to stall your pipeline like, like for, long, for long amount of cycles. If that answers your question. Issue, yeah. Yeah, that, that is so true. I observe that too. Uh, um, actually, I don't. I won't take much of your time. So, uh, lastly, how do I get involved in uh, the research that is being done on FHE in Intel Labs? So I see that uh, uh, I should uh, yeah. follow the privacy technology research group. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so those uh, research centers uh, are are Intel driven. We have uh, basically workshops that are open. Uh, to to everyone, so definitely follow those, right? And uh, the list of publications and things are kept uh, uh, basically up to date. 
Uh, and definitely, if you are interested in uh, certain academics and things like that, please do touch base. Of course, of course. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Yeah, there were many other questions. Yes. Mai, is that how you pronounce your name? Sorry if I mispronounced it. Uh, we can't hear you. No, still not. You. Uh, oh, how about now? How about now? Yeah, now. Yes. Uh, yep, lie was perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Ro, thank you for your time today. It was very educational. Um, but as you explain, Intel Labs is looking five, 10 years into the future. So I'm just curious, where do you guys think we're going to be with FHE in 10 years? What is the performance penalty going to be looking like at that time? Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I believe in three years from now, there, there, there is a reasonable confidence, right? That, uh, that performance will uh, go within, uh, within 10x. Okay, so there are two aspects to it. The first is a reduction of um, four to five orders of magnitude. That's something uh, that if you think to Intel Labs basically as a, as the moonshot division of Intel, I think we are already landing on the moon. So really the, the, the second thing is that how we go to Mars, right? So the idea to me uh, is the following, and, and that's where, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I am not particularly agreeing on, uh, on these things. You know, what performance do you need for this use case? Now, to me, you need to get the, the, um, the overhead of the ciphertext management operations, and you need to make that to disappear. For doing that, um, you need to, I mean, for being within 10x, you need to get into the billions of number theoretic transforms per second. Now, once that is done, you are basically pretty much confident that as uh, the data size of the data sets that you are approaching is increasing, right? Uh, um, you can keep up with the more stringent requirements uh, that the, 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 the moving forward in terms of accuracy. Now, for example, there are use cases, for example, in the, in the fraud detection uh, space where accuracy is not so much of a big of a deal. Why? Because even if you have, you know, a flip of a coin that is a little bit biased, you get something that is saving you a lot of money. Once you have done that, then you will enter into a roadmap that's saying, okay, now we need 10% more, 10% more, 10% more, 10% more, 10% more, 10 more in the same time. And that's not going to work anymore unless you have some hardware support that allows you to, um, uh, to keep up. So where I'm seeing, I'm seeing that performance uh, will um, most likely, there's quite some confidence. And of course, many things can go wrong in between now and then. Uh, will be available by 2024, right? From there on, uh, it's about spinning different uh, um, uh, versions of this, uh, this chip to the point that you can really make uh, uh, this ciphertext management operation to disappear. Now, I also hope, but here there is even less confidence because, and, and not because people are not good, it's just because making Theoretical advances is very difficult. You know, think to sorting. You know, the, the, the distance between a selection sort versus say, a radic sort, there's 30 years in the middle, <laughs> okay, before people started envisioning new things. Um, and so uh, if uh, there are such advances where the efficiency of the encryption procedure by looking at homomorphic encryption from different perspectives, reducing the key sizes, ring sizes, and things like that, then I am confident that even with uh, an incremental roadmap starting from 2024 ongoing, uh, we will have that homomorphic encryption will be completely invisible. Hopefully, by that time, um, the software stack is actually mature. Because software stack is, is probably one of the main concern um, I mean, it's counterintuitive to think to combinatorial circuit. You know, after all the advances in programming languages that happened in the past decades, right? If that answers your question. It, it does. Thanks much. Thanks again.
Great. Uh, Marc Olivier. Yes. Um, hi. Thank you all for this um, excellent talk. I hope we will get access to your slides because there are some enlightening uh, slides among uh, among them. And uh, <clears throat> it was a super pitch to make me being hungry about details uh, on uh, laws. You know. Yes. What's laws? Is it uh, big registers? Is it new instruction set? Ah. Uh, what? Yeah. What are you? I mean, I know it's work in progress. And no. uh, probably you didn't want to talk much, but I'm. Could you give us a little bit no, more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's very easy to to answer. Thanks for asking. I think I I didn't spell it out, right in the in the you slides. Did. Large so, arithmetic word size, yeah. yeah. Ah, yes, large arithmetic word size. So I did spell it out, but I didn't spend much time on it. So large arithmetic word size uh, stands, uh, for example, to have, uh, uh, like you were saying, so data paths and, and registers, right? Um, uh, that can uh, host natively um, uh, thousands of bit operands. So that's exactly what that is. Now, having said that, uh, um, that looks to the fact that the parameterization of encryption in some schemes Right, like for example, uh, ring learning with error is such that if you want to instantiate homomorphic encryption at 128 bit security, for example, to absorb uh, a circuit that is relatively large, or if you are not looking at that, but you're looking basically to bootstrap at every uh, gate, you need at least to instantiate 32K, um, yeah, yes and no. Uh, 32K uh, ring sizes, but to that uh, in uh, the ring LWE, uh, kind of uh, metaphor, so to speak, you actually end up having uh, uh, queues, like the coefficient, uh, the, the, the log queue that is a thousand bits, right? So now at that point, uh, uh, you, you need to deal with the processing natively 1000 bit without decomposing it um, um, uh, farther. The reality, um, is that you know things like residue number systems and thing, and other forms of representation still help you, right? While your data path is still going to be large, you can still decompose it in um, in smaller chunk. Um, but what becomes uh, um, important is uh, is the um, the amount of uh, single instruction and multiple data parallelism that you can. Um, to, you know, to, to give you an example, a more concrete example, um, if you want to, um, I, I, let me think about this. Uh, if you do want to do instantiate, right, like 32K ring size with, uh, with 1000 bit uh, coefficients, right? This means that to, operate on all this data in a single cycle, you need to have like a vector unit that is 32K times 1000 bits. Okay, of course you can do it differently depending on how much you do want to reuse your, uh, your register file because I mean, I mean, the architecture of these things is actually, the computer organization is very well known, right? It depends how you actually architect that. Now, the, if you think to that size of vector parallelism compared to what you have today on a microprocessor, which is 512 bits, not 32,000 times 1,000 bits, right? It's a lot, lot larger than what you have. That's one part of the difficulty, basically, of creating hardware for homomorphic encryption. There's also another portion of it that, uh, you know, oftentimes, and this is... Um, mostly uh, because of the, the mathematics of ring LWE schemes, uh, you cannot go too small in the word size because otherwise you have problems in instantiating the scheme, the schema. The, 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 and, um, and, you know, if you think, for example, on uh, um, accelerators that are designed basically to optimize operation on very, very specialized data types, oftentimes th those data types are such that they are very unfriendly to the mathematics of the schema. It's not even about the, the you know, you can't really map it. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the thing. And so if you think to this, there is a little bit of a divergence 
uh, when I go around with this story that the ciphertext needs to be a native data type, uh, I'm exactly addressing that divergence because you know you are optimizing for things that are completely unfriendly to homomorphic encryption from a mathematical perspective before going into the details, right? And here is instead what you need. You need something that natively processes ciphertexts. If that answer your question. Yes, thank you very much. Paul. Thank you. Yeah, I think Tanvir has yeah. also a question. Thanks. Uh, so, Ro, um, INRC, Intel Neuromorphic Research Community, they kind of opens up their hardware, such as the Loihi and the other ones, for the researchers to play around. So do you have any plans to opening up your ASIC designs? And how do we get in touch uh, with those uh, developments? Good question. Excellent question, actually. Um, so yes, um, um, the idea, and, and you know, this is more of a, um, a personal vision, but it's shared, right? Uh, so to me, and uh, also to probably some of Lai's you know, to Lai's point earlier, you know, where do you see this going a certain number of years from now? Um, and seeing comments earlier, you know, how do we architect this? So to me, this architecture, so I'm a researcher, okay? So the last thing that I can talk to you is about roadmaps, products, and teams. Because as a researcher, I enable the business unit to make educated decisions, and I can provide the part of the technology. And so to me, this first chip is going to be a research tool. So where we finally are capable of exploring uh, more exhaustively the application domain. So things that you cannot do it right now. So to me, and I, and I can't tell you when exactly, um, but definitely uh, post 2024, probably earlier. Um, one thing that uh, I do want, I do want universities and the prospective uh, partners and things like that to use it. And universities in particular, uh, because it's where people can create new schemes, trying new ideas, do all sorts of crazy applications that you can't do right now. And then, um, you know, I, I wear several hats, right? And sometimes, you know, I remove the researcher hat and I'm saying, okay, if I was somewhere else, so I, I, I need to know whether I want to do it or not. In this moment, I, I cannot tell you what exactly exploring the application domain will enable. There's a lot of potential now, but it's like um, we need to do a lot more. And in order to do that, you do need to move from existing hardware. That's where the revolutionary approach. So, so yes, I can give you uh, a date. So there will be early, um, um, how do I say this, triers, right? As um, uh, simulation, part of emulation will be available and things like that. But uh, the main goal is really to me is a research tool and we'll probably follow the same model as, uh, as Lohi. Thank you. Thanks for the question, actually. So it's, it's, you touched the, like uh, a button that is very dear to me. So to me, this is this, this is a research tool. Um, yeah. Cool. Do we have any other questions? I think there were a couple of questions asked uh, in the chat, but I think some of them has been, have been answered. Uh, maybe there is a question from somebody called iPhone 12 Bob. Okay, I don't know if you're here, iPhone 12 Bob, to ask your question directly to Ro. Okay, so I guess Bob yeah. is not here. Yes. Oh, you no, are here. I, okay. Perfect. Okay. How Go many ahead. chips do you expect when you talk about uh, billions of NTTs per second? How many chips is your expectation? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, um, you know, I can uh, talk about the example that I was giving earlier. Um, so, uh, so, okay, let me rephrase the question to make sure that, uh, that I'm answering the right question. So are you saying, uh, how many cores do you need to use to get to billions of entity per second? Y yes, how much? So that, that's what is the equivalent number silicon? of cores? 
Okay. Yeah. So uh, the thing, uh, look at the example that I um, that I had earlier of that neural network that has probably ten to twenty layers and is using Cipher ten uh, for things. And uh, so the, in in that setting, doing homomorphic um, um, uh, encryption inference with some uh, um, uh, you know with bootstrapping um, and things, it, it was four hours per inference to bring that into within the range of 100 milliseconds per uh, per uh, per inference which is exactly the billions of uh, entity per second that we are talking about it's the same range uh, you need about 100,000 cores with respect to the, the 112 that were used for that experiments okay if that makes sense but don't be too stuck on the entity because entity is kind of a proxy for performance but it's not quite um, and the reason for that is because it's not that you enter entity and you stay entity for three hours. You enter exit entities continuously. So, so, so optimizing only the entity is, is part of it, but you need to optimize a much larger data path to, to, to actually rip off performance. Um, and um, if that answers your question. Yes, a hundred thousand core equivalents. Uh, but how many do you how many do you expect to would you expect to put on a chip today in whatever technology you have? Uh, that's a question that is really not for me uh, to to answer. <laughs> yes. So remember, okay, but hundred thousand large large core equivalent. That's all. That's okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's consistent, I guess, with what we're seeing on our side uh, as well. It's uh, uh, whether it's GPUs or CPUs, you're going to need a lot, a lot of them if you want to run things today very efficiently. Uh, so it's going to cost a lot of money. But uh, uh, hopefully, the accelerator is coming soon. will uh, reduce that to just a few cores, right? Mm -hmm. uh, OK, great. Do we have any other questions? I have one. Uh, first of all, thanks, Ra. Uh, really enjoyable presentation. Uh, for the actual questions, where do you think the most speed up is going to come from? Either on the algorithmical side, the computer architecture side, or from new silicon technologies? Ah, good. Uh, that's a very good question. You know, the um, the speed up that you get. Uh, that's actually thank you. So the speed up that you get from the the technology, right? It's a, a how do I say? It's a systematic type of thing. Right, so you reduce the thing like four orders of magnitude, then you have a better starting point. Right, this doesn't mean that you need to write to write a sloppy homomorphic encryption programs, and and the reason for that is because if you do write a sloppy homomorphic encryption program, no matter how how good is your hardware, your performance is going to sink. Now it's going to be a lot better than existing hardware by probably a few orders of magnitude, not four, two, right? <laughs> but keep in mind that the sloppy homomorphic encryption program means a lot more data movement. So, you know, having said that, and, and there, was, uh, there was a question that probably seeing uh, at the earlier about batching. You know, batching is a great thing, but it's not always applicable. So to me, and, and I don't know, this is, uh, this is probably something that Pascal was saying, uh, uh, was sharing with me at some point and, and things. And I has this vision that instead of doing HTTPS, you do HTTPZ, right? Where uh, where basically the, you access and there is homomorphic encryption. That's a great vision. You know, when you do that uh, and you consider that any time that you do that and there is a mashup page with all the advertisement and things like that, forget about doing batching. You can't because you don't know what to batch. Uh, so So you do need that raw performance. And currently, you know, uh, a, a homomorphic encryption multiplication is a million times slower than a multiplication on CPU in clear text. So there, there's nothing to do. There's an algorithmic gap in there. So you you need the the, the a better algorithm is better than anything else. Okay. So the, the taxonomy is still the same. So better algorithm better than anything else. There's an algorithmic gap that the hardware can bridge. And if you look at the DARPA program. So it's actually a very good, it's a, it's a very pointy program because it's saying we are not expecting much more advanced, uh, advances on these schemes that we are very kind of, 
more confident than others about security. So therefore, it's the right time to start throwing transistors at it. So you are basically bridging that, systematic, that gap systematically. But the majority of the performance improvement will come uh, from, from, from updates, you know, algorithms and memory hierarchy, not, not the compute. The compute, you can make it as, as fast as you want, but it's only as good as your ability to move data agilely. Uh, and it's the same problem, well, not the same. It's a similar problem that you have in AI chips, right? But with the different data, data path tweets and things like that, it's a little more complex, in fact. And processing in memory technologies, like how do you see that develop in the next uh, ah. year? So I have uh, a sequel of paper about the processing in memory and homomorphic encryption, um, design automation conference and things like that. You know, processing in so to me, when, when you are talking, <laughs> thanks for the question, I should have added the slides with those bars so that, um, okay, so to me, when I'm talking about re-architecting the memory hierarchy, processing in memory is an extreme of that, right? Because you, so with the processing in memory, if you look uh, at my uh, digital uh, library a paper in 2020, uh, that is, I believe it's called the CryptoPIM, um, it's the first paper that is showing hundreds of thousands of entity per second. It's really the first in a single chip, not like in a, in a, in a multiple things. And it's not that on simulation you cannot scale that performance. You could. The truth is that the processing in memory um, and, and at least the latest bleeding edge uh, rely on um, uh, memory cells that, um, you know, to date we cannot really fabricate reliably in large embodiments. So I think that's another aspect of research where you do need to, because you know, as soon as you start, uh, the technology becomes less and less reliable. Homomorphic encryption is not that resilient uh, to, to errors, right? It's, it's probably the wrong technology to be resilient to errors because it's cryptography. Um, and so, so there is a problem there. So I think it's a future, future, future. And it's definitely worth uh, looking into it. Can you have a technology that brings you to billions of entities per second with the current processing in memory technologies? Even in a few years from now, I doubt that you can fabricate it. Thanks, Ra. Mm -hmm. I think we have another question from Mashtaba. Thank you. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, my question is, uh, there are two uh, main, actually, time-consuming part in, uh, I suppose, in the FHE. Uh, one of them is actually the uh, computation part uh, using the entity, for example, and another one will be uh, the transportation, uh, the actually sending the uh, encrypted data to the cloud and uh, receive the data after that. So. Uh, I know that the hardware accelerator can accelerate uh, the first part by uh, performing more and more actually entity computation, which is feasible, but what we should do for the uh, second part, because I, I think that uh, the size of the cyber text here will be extended compared to the uh, plain text. And in the lattice space, for, for example, cryptography, the main issue is, uh, uh, although they are actually even faster than ECC-based crypto, but uh, the size of the key is actually more extended than uh, the classical crypto. So uh, there will be a, an, an issue here. So mm -hmm. what we should do for the FHE? Okay, so there is the, the answer that I don't like, which is the one that I'm going to give you first, okay? <laughs> so the answer that I don't like is that communication technology is improving and therefore there is plenty of bandwidth, okay? And it's not a problem to send. Okay, now having plenty of bandwidth to me doesn't mean that we need to waste it. Okay, uh, there is a different route. Uh, uh, you can create a protocol. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the principle, but then there are several gotchas into it. Um, you can create a product. Uh, and go, uh, Okay, let me say this first. You can create a protocol, right, for which you actually, uh, your bulk encryption and transmission can be done, let's say, with the advanced encryption standard. You know, get the mode of operation, ASGCM, 
very high throughput and things like that. Now, on the decryption side, what you what you could do, right, is basically evaluating the decryption function homomorphically. So, which means that the input of ASGCM is uh, is AS encrypted, and the output of ASGCM is uh, is homomorphically encrypted with something else. Right now, your bottleneck becomes doing very, very fast that decryption to an extreme. And in fact, there is a new study. And, and so, for that reason, um, uh, there is a, a, a branch of research that looks into low latency block ciphers that are designed with a small multiplicative depth. The first one, I believe, it's called that, that I have seen or I'm aware of, it's called the LOMC, right? And now there is a study group that is starting at ISO that is exactly looking at these block ciphers with uh, with the small multiplicative depth to um, um, you know to combine it with the privacy enhancing the cryptography, not necessarily homomorphic encryption because there is a value to evaluate these things privately anyway. Now the problem that you have with this is as long as you are processing bits, everything is fine. But if you start having a kind of arithmetic circuits and things like that, and you start introducing some flavor of, uh, you know, these ring LWE schemes, then you end up uh, in the fact that after decryption, your uh, message space might be too small. So for some application, you know, that might work, other application might not. The point is, uh, and that's the part, you know, every researcher on this call who is interested in, you know, making a hardware that does, a mo that mixes up homomorphic encryption and block cipher is, is, is a fundamental part of the IT infrastructure. Uh, so everyone is stick to the computation because of the computational problem. We understand that it's been around for, 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 for 30 years. Um, uh, but, 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 but that um, kind of stub devices that uh, are part of the IT infrastructure and that can convert from one type of encryption to another, right, very, very quickly, at the line rate of, uh, so without wasting the bandwidth uh, of 5G or XG, whatever, but at the line rate of supplying the data for processing, that is actually an open area of research. I think it's very promising, especially for, for uh, individuals that are skillful in, uh, you know, applied cryptography and uh, hardware design for cryptography protocols. Because even the protocol, the protocol is actually cute because you can provision the decryption key enveloped into an homomorphic encryption envelope. And then and it's kind of cute um, uh, the way you can architect it. And um, yeah, so yeah, no, yeah, you should not, in my opinion, you should not be wasteful of bandwidth. There are things that can be done, but require a lot more research. Thank you so much. I think, by the way, since we're talking about ISO, uh, so you happen to be the main editor of the yes. upcoming standard on photomorphic encryption, which I don't know if people, the attendees are aware of this, but which is upcoming, I think in a couple of more years or so. Um, I know that we can, I mean, uh, in ISO, we're uh, by ISO rules, we cannot like share a lot publicly, but Maybe can you say a few words about how the work there is going on? Yeah. So as uh, by the way, thanks for the support actually in the various. Uh, you know, the pandemic didn't particularly help, help with the ISO meetings, and so we we did the split heads. Pascal was always there, basically at various, <laughs> you know, summarizing meetings <laughs> and things, vouching for what we had done earlier. So it's um, so how it is going? It is going that we started with um, a year and a half ago or more. This actually was a long run, but not so long if you think the time of standardization. We started with the study period on uh, on fully homomorphic encryption. Now is this new work item. Um, and uh, the way uh, the standard is organized is basically to capture uh, both ring LWE and um, ring GSW based, based schemes. Um, you know, there are four of them that meet the maturity criteria for being standardized at ISO. So namely BGV, BFV, CKKS, and, uh, and CGGI. 
which is a great thing. Um, we do have uh, a draft of the working draft that is being uh, uh, further drafted um, uh, like this. And we are arranging that basically in a series of uh, um, working uh, calls. Um, so the idea is basically to specify the schemes uh, at the level of details that uh, helps for principal implementations, right? But it doesn't go too much into um, uh, uh, the weeds of things that, uh, you know, might even compromise or either compromise security or not mature enough basically to be uh, adopted. So we are going basically to have the first committee draft in the middle of next year, most likely. So there are several stages on, on standardization. Um, there is the working draft and then the committee draft and then the, um, um, the draft international standards. And then there is the publication, which is expected in uh, mid 2024 20, Pascal, I learned all these things in the in the months. <laughs> right? And so we because of the work that we have done when it uh, came uh, to basically approve a new work item, um, uh, the various voters, uh, right, were, clear, were, were very confident that we could have a schedule that is very aggressive to go through all these milestone one per year. And so there is one per year and you see how the standard, you know, is expected to be published in 2024. Um, uh, yeah, pretty much. So we'll keep on working on it uh, um, and, um, and provide, uh, um, you know, updates to the rest of the community as uh, in, in a timely manner. Uh, like that, but uh, having a standard. Um, so the other part that was interesting, uh, probably I think uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, Pascal had uh, this standard called, uh, called Domomorphic Encryption published in 2006. You know, uh, I would like to make everyone aware that in 2006, fully homomorphic encryption did not exist. Okay, so the standard that covers homomorphic encryption will be renamed as partial homomorphic encryption. And the standard that does fully homomorphic encryption is the one that does fully homomorphic, homomorphic encryption on polynomial rings uh, with the various uh, bolts and um, uh, artifacts for bootstrapping. Um, what else can we say about this? Levels of security. So this is important. Um, we are looking, so this is something that is unique um, in the ISO standardization that didn't happen before. So we started with this table of security parameters uh, for different level of um, um, uh, security and capacity of the instantiation of the schema that was uh, uh, studied and published by homomorphicencryption.org. Um, you know, what this table uh, gives to you is basically a worst case scenario of parameters, but clearly you can start playing around and find all sort of combination of things that still meet that level of security, uh, but with better performance, because you are more frugal on the parameters. Okay, so that was one thing. At ISO, people say that this is a great starting point, but we don't quite like it. Uh, we would like to have a margins around these parameters. So this is a work that is uniquely done uh, into, and not only that, uh, the parameters and the margins that will be annotated, basically will be, will be noted inside the, the the standard document will provide uh, um, recommendations for both uh, classic level of security and post quantum security. So, which is, uh, I think it's quite a contribution, honestly, uh, in uh, to the community. And uh, in addition to the standard, did, did I miss anything else, Pascal? Th th thanks for uh, for pulling this from me. No, sure. Um, just maybe a clarification that what is being standardized is really at the crypto level which is the first thing to standardize anyway, right? But it, it, it doesn't include like everything that goes around instrumenting and deploying uh, homomorphic encryption, like how do you generate the parameters? How, how do you compile? How do you convert like a, a, a clear text program into a homomorphic program? Or, so I think these kind of things will probably appear in the next years, but it's more, something that will be done like i guess on the long run you know as we 
as we go as as we go forward and understand better and better what it means to create homomorphic programs. You know, it's something that is not as simple as the crypto. Uh, I know I shouldn't say that because the crypto is not necessarily simple, uh, but it's the simplest thing that we can go on and standardize right now, and it's now mature enough scientifically. Uh, but there will this 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 is very exciting because I think the standard is probably the first that will you know open the way to the others, uh, maybe in programming languages, maybe in execution platforms for morphic computations. Um, so it's very exciting that it's it's going to be there. And also the I mean the industry needs to be driven by standards, so so that the industry can actually invest you know in solutions. And uh, so it will be I think. It, possibly a game changer um, when when this standard will actually be published you know in a couple of years so it's a it's a very exciting time and uh, i want to add one more thing because it's uh, it's interesting so the standard for homomorphic encryption because because Pascal, so one of the problems that we had to solve is uh, what is the standardization strategy right and the standard for homomorphic encryption is an extension of the existing standard series um, uh, of uh, cryptography, um, cryptographic primitives. And, you know, I, I cannot, I, honestly, I cannot see uh, a more appropriate way to standardize the homomorphic encryption, especially if we look into the deployments uh, that, that look into public key cryptography. Uh, or where basically from the client perspective, really nothing changes uh, from, from the perspective of the protocol and the little life cycles and things. So you can look at that perspective and that becomes an extension of the encryption standard series. If we were to do multi-key homomorphic encryption and things like this, that's something that falls under uh, a completely different thing. It's not only cryptographic primitives. Um, so to speak, this is actually, uh, I think it's very appropriate um, uh, what we did. And then moving forward, as Pascal was saying, as we understand more, you know, programming languages, my opinion, will, will play a significant role um, into that, but also the intersection of this foundational standard, right, with the other um, domain application standards, as well as um, yeah, so this will be really foundational for the development um, and adoption. Thank you very much, Ro. Uh, thank you for this talk. Uh, this was really super interesting. Um, if you have any other questions, guys, uh, we actually have a Discord server now uh, that you can post all your questions to. We already have our next meetup planned, which is going to be before Christmas. Uh, it's going to be about hardware as well, but a very different type. It's going to be about optical computing for homomorphic encryption uh, by Octalysis, which is a startup working on that. Uh, we're also going to be changing the format. We're no longer going to be using Zoom. Instead, we're going to be using Discord, and we're going to be streaming directly the meetup from Discord so that we can chat and we can actually have a conversation in Discord directly. Uh, it's gonna be a lot friendlier, I think, than Zoom and <clears throat> a lot more fun as well for people to, to interact. Um, all the information are on fhg.org. Ro, thank you very much. Uh, send us your slides and we'll put this online as with the video on fhg.org uh, next week. Thank you very Bye. much everyone and see you in a month.